Roy Oskalsen is professor of linguistics and English language at BYU. He received his PhD in linguistics at the University of Illinois and was an assistant professor of linguistics at the University of Texas at Austin before coming to BYU. He has been a visiting professor of linguistics at the University of California at San Diego, a Fulbright lecturer at the University of Tampere, Finland, Tampere, Finland, and a research fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics in Nimegen, Holland. He has been editor of the Book of Mormon Critical Text Project since 1988. His 2009 Yale University Press edition of the Book of Mormon is the most important edition of that book since 1830. Professor Skousen. So I'm going to talk about poetic structures and textual criticism um, in the Book of Mormon, how they relate. Um, I'm going to particularly talk about chiasmus and uh, parallelism as the poetic structures. Um, at the beginning of this, I'm not going to give an example dealing with uh, chiasmus, but one dealing with um, a conjecture in the Book of Mormon text, but it deals with an issue of how we make conjectures. It brings up the idea that there's two kinds of evidence when you make an argument for a reading. One is external evidence. And external evidence is really sort of the physical evidence. There's a manuscript out there, or there are some manuscripts, or there's scribal practice and actual errors that you can look at. And uh, these things are the, um, the really the heart of making changes and um, conjectures and uh, emendations to the text. Um, there is a second part. Um, which is internal evidence. It's more uh, subjective, uh, psychological. It has to do with, the, you look at the whole text as itself and how the language uh, behaves in the text and other readings in the text and so forth and what kind of constructions are used there. And um, the main point I think I'm going to make in this paper is the poetic structures belong in this second the internal evidence. And in and of itself, you don't want to use internal evidence alone to make changes. You always want to look for some external evidence from actual manuscripts or scribal practice that can support. Um, we will also see that uh, the poetic structures are usually after the fact that once we see a change and it's made, we can say, oh yes, there's a chiasmus here that we weren't observing. There's a parallelism here that we missed. And I think it's, sometimes people write to me about suggested changes in the text and say, if you make this change, you'll get a chiasmus or you'll get something parallel. And we have to be very careful with this kind of argument because there's nothing really there except you're seeing this uh, relationship. Okay, so the example I'm going to talk about is Ye in Helaman 3, 2 and 3. And I'm going to try and read it here. And there was, and there was no contention among the people in the 40 and 4th uh, year. Neither was there much contention in the 40 and 5th year. And it came to pass in the 40 and 6th, yea, there were much contentions and many dissensions. This is the way um, the current text reads. It, the original manuscript reads this way. The printer's manuscript, all the printed editions, um, standard printed editions read this way. Um, and there are some symbols there representing the different sources. Um, the external, there's external evidence though that this reading should be year, not yay. But we don't have it with this particular piece of uh, this part of the manuscript because it actually reads yay there. But if we look elsewhere in the manuscript, we see that Oliver Cowdery's got a problem with the word year. He, over and over, well, relatively speaking, five or six times, 
writes the word year as yea. And um, so we end up with Helaman 3 and 3 with one case where the originals got yea. So looking at this, I've, I've put five of them here. Uh, we have in Alma 28 and 10, the first year, original manuscript has year, and Oliver, when he wrote, the printers first wrote yea, and later he came in and put the R in, and it's in slightly heavier ink. This means he's making a correction, probably when he proofed it. But it shows his tendency to drop the R. Now, this is external evidence. We're seeing what Oliver's actually doing. Or the next one, uh, he, in the original manuscript, here's one where he wrote yea, and then he corrects it to year, adds the R. And what I'm proposing is in Helaman 3 and 3, he did a yea, and he didn't correct it. In Alma 48 and 2, in the latter end of the 19th year, uh, well, we have yea in the printers. We don't have the original here. We just have a yea. The typesetter here put in year. He wasn't going to put up with yea there. In Alma 4821, in the latter end of the 19th year, here we have the original. It's year. Oliver wrote yea, and he didn't correct it. The typesetter set yea. And it sat there till 1849 when Orson Pratt looked at it and says, hey, something's wrong here. We're missing the word year, so I'll put it in. So he put it in, but he left yay. This is the way the current text reads here. Year yay. And finally, Alma 56.1, in the commencement of the 30th year, original manuscript, this is another one where he caught it. So this is external evidence. This is showing, hey, you know, Oliver really has a problem, and it's probably best to assume that he made this mistake in Helaman 3 and 3. But we can turn to internal evidence and find two strong internal arguments that indeed Helaman 3 and 3 is ye year, not yea. So the first one is... Yea, when we look at it elsewhere in the text, every legitimate yea is modifying or amplifying, saying something about what was just said before. Well, it turns out in Helaman 3 and 3, yea is gratuitous. It's just yea. <laughs> it isn't really commenting on anything that went before. It isn't reversing it. It isn't amplifying it. The second one is, well, that year can be ellipted. This means omitted in the Book of Mormon text. But every time it's omitted, the word year appears either in the same phrase or in the same clause. That doesn't happen in Helaman 3 and 3. It's an exception to this internal uh, systematic aspect. So I put three of them here, and all this was done in the 50 and 8th and 9th years. So it doesn't say in the 58th and in the 59th, you know, 58th year and in the 59th year. It could have done this, but it didn't. Or examples like from the first year to the 15th. It's in the text. There's no year there. So you can have year missing. But it's very well defined where it occurs. And the trouble with Helaman 3 and 3 is it's missing um, in, a, in a place where it can't be recovered from the clause. The clause itself doesn't have the word year. Now, the previous clause and the one before it does have year, but it's a separate clause. So these are internal. They're not... I think the one, the fact that yea, 1,254 times always amplifies upon what was just said is a very strong internal bit of evidence. Okay. So I end up proposing it's year, and it, there's no yea at all. And we go back to the other one where Orson Pratt put a year in, and we keep that, but we take out the yea. 
so we don't end up with any year yays at all. The two important points that I want to make here is that poetic structures are internal evidence. And if we don't have any external evidence, we don't want to go around messing with the text. Um, but what is interesting, though, is sometimes with external evidence, we find a new reading, an amended one, and it supports. It supports a poetic structure. So we'll talk about one of them here. So here, the, you know, parallelism is where you just repeat. This is mostly what we find in Hebrew poetry, but chiasmus also. So here's a chiastic argument, and I think it's accurate. Um, I think it indicates how we should interpret this passage. It says near the bottom of this, about speaking of the atonement, to bring about the plan of mercy to appease the demands of justice, that God might be a perfect, just God, and a merciful God also. Now, this is how the current text reads, and a comma is placed after perfect. So, this is, this is one interpretation. We're going to make perfect an adjective, so that the phrase is saying that God is perfect and God is just. The original manuscript is not extant here, and there's a little bit of space extra. There could have been an ampersand, a perfect and a just, a perfect and just God. We don't know whether it was lost or not. But one interpretation here is we're going to say that it's an adjective and that God is not only just, but also perfect. However, this goes against a chiastic view of this passage. So if we look at perfect as an adverb, now in English today we don't like adverbs, generally speaking, unless they have an L-Y. You know, your school teacher wants you to say you ran slowly, but they never tell you to say that you ran fastly. They don't have their grammar fully down. But in any event, in in the Book of Mormon, and in earlier English, very often there was a, what's called a bare adverb. It used to have an a uh at the end, and it stood for the ly. It was an alternative way of expressing it. And the Book of Mormon, in its original form, original text, has quite a few of these. There's another possibility here, actually, that the original manuscript read perfectly just a perfectly just God, and the L-Y got lost. Now, I don't think this happened because, generally speaking, the text doesn't lose L-Ys. So, but I think the first one of these two, the third one listed here, is what it should read. And the reason is chiastic. So first of all, though, what is the evidence in the original text for bare adverbs? And here you have quite a few examples. The delta in front means that it has been amended. L-Y has been added. So I have spoken plain is the way the original text reads. Plainly was added, 1920 edition. Brother Talmadge just doesn't like it. And uh, there are several others. There are a few in there, though, where the bare adverb is still there, and you can see them. So the evidence... Um, well, there's also, all those examples in that previous one are sentential ad, that is, they're adverbs modifying the verb. But I've, here's a couple of examples where the adverb's modifying um, an adjective. And I think it is. The first one maybe isn't, but you can argue a state of awful, fearful, looking for of the fiery indignation of the wrath of God upon them. It's a wonderful manipulation of Hebrews. But what does awful fearful mean? Does it mean, and I think it means awfully fearful. The fear is just awesome. It's, but one that's more clear is probably a wonderful great army. The original way it reads, Brother Talmadge changed it to a wonderfully great, adds the L-Y. So you can have 
it's possible that a perfect just God actually means a perfectly just God. Now, we're looking at other kinds of evidence throughout the text of internal evidence of how this is being used uh, in the, uh, in the uh, Book of Mormon. Well, here's the chiastic argument. If you look at this passage and do it chiastically, what you're really getting is nothing about perfection of God, but it's mercy on the outer parts and justice on the inner. So, to bring about the plan of mercy, to appease the demands of justice, that God might be a perfect just God, a perfectly just God, completely just, and a merciful God also. So there's nothing in here really about God being perfect. We know it's true, but the emphasis is on him being perfectly just. So a chiastic argument here would say the perfect doesn't really belong there and we'll interpret it as an adverb. Okay. So one of the things that happens is that once you discover the true reading, the based on the manuscripts and so forth, you may find you have a chiastic reading. And Bob Smith here has noted this one. I never noticed it. I read the original manuscript and discovered that the word covenant was really not covenant, but um, see if I get this thing right, consecrated. And Oliver, the original manuscript reads, uh, the first one, um, that it was the Lord hath consecrated this land unto the seed and so forth. And when he copied it, he put in the wrong verb. It's because or a little bit earlier that verb occurs. And so he ended up uh, changing the text. It doesn't, it is an overwhelmingly uh, difficult a reading that results, uh, but it did remove the chiasmus from the original. And But you'll notice that I never even noticed it, and I never argued for it. Uh, once you have it, based on the actual manuscript reading, you say, oh yes, that's really good. But notice, you know, Bob didn't come up with the chiastic reading in and of itself. Now, I'm sure you could go through the text and find places, oh, I'll change this word, and it'll make this reading chiastic. And I don't recommend that. I think when you do it purely on the basis of internal evidence, you're, you're, you're going to make so many changes, it, it would become uninteresting and um, shouldn't be done. Okay. Um, Scribal corrections support chiastic structure. This is an interesting one um, that um, the scribe two of the printer's manuscript omitted the word because. Um, and behold, he did deliver them because they did humble themselves before him. And they cried mightily unto him. He did deliver them out of bondage, is the way scribe two wrote it. He missed the word because. Oliver was proofing it, though, against the original, we believe here, and he put in the word because, and now it's a wonderful chiasmus. And um, this one is a more semantic one, did humble themselves before him. I put it in Italics, cried mightily unto him, is this, you know, you know, if you have to pray to the Lord mightily, you've probably been humbled. So there is a semantic chiasmus here. Uh, after, when I found this one, then I went and checked the rest of the text to see if I could find more of these. And there are several of them. It's really quite interesting to see them. Here's one that also is semantic. And um, desired it is repeated, so the actual lexical part in the central, the B part, but the A is more semantic, but this one I like a lot because it's purely lexical, both the outer and the inner parts of the chiasmus. Um, 
And you wonder in this, you know, as people have been asking, well, why is the Lord doing this? Why is anybody doing this? Well, I don't have an answer because I haven't been able to talk to the authors, but, you know, it's, it's there for sure. Okay, a couple of chiastic Isaiah quotations. Uh, we saw uh, Don gave some very good examples of mostly, I think, uh, where the uh, Qumran manuscript violated the chiasmus. Um, Maybe you can tell us somewhere, maybe they got a better chiasm, or they got a chiasmus with the change. In any event, the Book of Mormon gets more chiasmus in certain places than uh, the Isaiah, the Masoretic text. Um, this is one that, um, this is the way the original and printer's manuscript reads, talking about the prey on the outside and the inside captive in the singular, both of them in the singular original and printer's manuscript. The 1830 typesetter, probably because one of them in the Masoretic is in the plural, he made them both plural. So this is what the printed edition has going down. Let's see, all standard editions, pray, captives, captives, pray. So it retains a chiasmus, although it shifted it to both plurals. Uh, the Masoretic has a... Um, Well, it, 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 it's, it's sort of generic. You could do it either singular or plural. You cannot tell. But the, but the King James Bible has a singular and a plural. And it really, it's, it, it's still chiastic, obviously, because it's the same word. But singular and plural shows a, a, a partial violation. Uh, here's one with chiastic word choice. The Book of Mormon reads... The stay and the staff, the whole staff of bread and the whole stay of water. But that isn't how your King James reads. So it reads, basically going down here, the stay, staff, stay, stay. It has stay three times and staff once. And probably because there's a femina, feminine form nominalization of the verb, for the second one, and the other three are masculine, and so the, 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 it's the same verb, and the translators chose to make a lexical distinction. But it is interesting, the Book of Mormon has it chiastically pure, and um, interesting. Well, I want to mention parallelism. So, this is an interesting example where you know, we believe, we, we believe in the text we have in front of us that we're blind to parallelism. I think this one should have been seen, but it wasn't until we could actually see the manuscripts. But this reads, Alma 42, Now repentance could not come unto man except there were a punishment, which also was as eternal as the life of the soul. Pause. A fix should be affixed opposite to the plan of happiness, which was as eternal also as the life of the soul. Now, what's parallel here is the reference to being eternal as the life of the soul. And the typesetter, when he was marking up the printer's manuscript, put a semicolon after the first life of the soul. He wanted a break there. But when he went to typeset it, he changed his mind and he put a comma after should be. So this is the way your text reads. Which also was as eternal as the life of the soul should be. Comma. Affixed opposite to the plan of happiness, which was eternal also as the life of the soul. Well, this is really, it's upset the parallelism. It's introduced a weird notion that the life of the soul should be eternal when it is. And the whole point of this is it is eternal, not that it should be. Well, the other question is, this is internal evidence. We're going to see if we can find this weird syntax. And we can. The existential there. Here's, several, here's two more besides the one in Alma. First Nephi. Can't read 1820. And there was 
Nothing, save it were the power of God, which threatened them with destruction, could soften their hearts. A modal could soften. And there was nothing could soften their hearts. That's the syntax. Book of Mormon has this syntax. And so, should be affixed is correct. Same thing with the other one in Enos. And I say there was nothing would keep them from going down speedily to destruction. These are correctly punctuated. And so the syntax is retained. And a little bit on conjunctive repetition. Repet uh, Book of Mormon loves to repeat prepositions. And, um, but sometimes it doesn't. And should we go in and repeat them? Because it does it most of the time. I don't think so. That would be taking the, the, the poetic structure and, and just overdoing it. So here's a few of them, though. I mean, it's, it's sort of mind-boggling. This is a Hebraism in most cases, with the preposition just being repeated over and over, uh, and both by fire and by tempest and by earthquakes and by bloodsheds and by pestilence and by famine. We in English prefer just to put it the first time and let it go. Okay, so Oliver, in one place, he missed the parallelism. And uh, the text should read that uh, there was great rejoicing among the brethren of Pohoran and also among the people of Liberty. He won the recall election. Everybody's happy. His relatives and the, uh, the people of Liberty. But Oliver, when he was copying to the printer's manuscript, he switches pages and he doesn't remember he doesn't get it quite right. He looks at it too quickly, and he, re he writes among the second one as many. And he catches part of his error, but he's missing the of and the typesetter puts in the of. And so now you get something like it was much rejoicing among the brethren of Pahoran and also many of the people of liberty. It's a modern-day election. Not everybody was for the person they voted for. Well, I don't think that's the way you should interpret it. It is among, among, it's repeated. Well, the conjunctive repetition of among. So we, we see it, and I put several of them here. But I want to show you one. What about exceptions? What if I find a place where one of the amongs is missing? Like in this one. And behold, there was peace in all the land, insomuch that the Nephites did go into whatsoever part of the land they would, whether among the Nephites or the Lamanites. No among, no repeated among. And it came to pass that the Lamanites did also go whithersoever they would, whether it were among the Lamanites or among the Nephites. Now the temptation here is to say, aha, I'm going to put among in the first one. I'm going to repeat it because I see it everywhere. But there are other places where among isn't repeated, so you don't do it. Okay, I've got to stop. This one's in your handout. I thought I should put this in. This is a completely different kind of chiasmus. We're having chiasmus where there are words or ideas which are repeated. This is a chiasmus that's in the Book of Mormon that is the subject verb agreement. It's completely different. We have a name for it, um, and I'm going to call it syntactic chiasmus in the spirit of this meeting. So here is the example of it in the Book of Mormon, and you're going to see you have a subject, and you've got to match it up with a predicate. You all know how to do this. You did it in the sixth grade first or something like that. And here, this was discovered by Carol Morgan in 1990. The question, oh, this is not in the Book of Mormon. She wrote this in a paper, and I didn't even notice it. The question that linguists who study this matter have debated is whether nesting can occur to the level of two. So we got, first of all, the question is, well, let's see. The question is whether nesting can occur at level two. That's the outer one. Inner one, we put the first inner one in. 
The question that linguists have debated is whether nesting can occur at the level of two. That's doing okay. Then you come to the third one and you think, is this English? It is. The question that linguists who study the matter have debated is whether test nesting can occur to the level of two. Noam Chomsky was the first one that came up with the idea that these things should be in English, but his examples were so bad that no one believed him. But people now have been discovering these things, and the Book of Mormon has one. It's amazing. So Fred Carlson, uh, the University of Helsinki, a good friend of mine, colleague, um, has done the major work on studying these multiple nested embeddings. And um, he doesn't have the Book of Mormon in his list, but he needs to. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, interesting one. Well, here it is. And it hath become expedient that I, according to the will of God, that the prayers of those which have gone hence, which were the holy ones, should be fulfilled according to their faith, should make a record of these things which have been done. It's torturous, but it's there. I've always, I've, I've been saying for 20 some years, the Book of Mormon text is very complex, much more complex than its critics give it. They mock, but they're not studying it. And this is an incredible kind of chiasmus. I think we should add it to the list of possibilities here. But it exists in English otherwise as well. Okay, I will quit on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have time for a few questions. Well, this wants to know if I have any insight into the relative frequency of chiasms in early modern English versus modern English. Well, I don't know. I guess the Book of Mormon is an early modern English one. Or am I related to Cleon Skousen? All Skousens are related. <laughs> but he is my uncle. And uh, my father died when he was 46, and Cleon Skousen was sort of the second father to our family. And um, I feel very close to him. Other questions? Any more questions? Anybody from the audience? Okay. Thank you. Down oh, down here? Is there a place where we can get all of your suggested, perhaps, changes based on your study? Is it, is that, I know you've got one project you've worked on for years. Is that completed? Oh, no, no. You know, when it's completed, I'll die. <laughs> but um, there will be a chapter in part six of the critical. Oh, there's more here. And part six that um, will list all of the conjectural emendations that I know of that people have made, including myself. I've uh, only adopted about one out of every four of my own suggested, suggested emendations. I'm running about one out of every five for other people's suggested emendations. I list them all. And they're also basically discussed in analysis of textual variants, the six books. If you probably look, do a search on conjecture, you'll in in the uh, it's on um, the interpreter, Mormon interpreter, and you can get it electronic. You can just search for conjecture, and you'll probably find virtually all of them there. Oh, I've got a couple more. What about nested embeddings in other sacred textual traditions? Well, you'll have to look. I don't know. I don't even know what Fred's got. Is the bare adverb a feature of Hebrew, or was it more like a feature? No, it's not. Well, it's in dialects of English even today, the bare adverb. I ran slow. I say that all the time. I don't have to put slowly on. But in early modern English, it's much more prominent the loss. I spoke plain to him. And it's still in dialects in the 19th century. How could Alma 40 awfully be manipul 
manipulation of Hebrews when Hebrews has not been written yet by Paul. Ah, but the Book of Mormon is a language that the translation is influenced by the King James Bible. You'll have to read more about it. Perfectly just God. Does the change the perfectly that you recommend experience God's justice at the expense of his mercy? No. Why? It's also perfectly merciful. But usually we don't think of it that way. We think of mercy of letting you off the hook. So that's why he's going to emphasize perfectly just and still merciful. It's going to take something, isn't it? Okay. Thank you.